For the ten plagues of Egypt, as recorded in Exodus chapter 7 through 11, all overt miraculous acts of God. Yes, according to Moses. No, according to the natural cause and effect theory of Greta Hort, first published in 1957, and today widely cited in Bible reference books and encyclopedias. However, Hort's ideas have never been subjected to independent scientific scrutiny until that of Brad Sparks in 2003. The Ten Plagues of Egypt by Russell Grigg According to Hort, the first plague of blood was a massive amount of red algae plus a huge quantity of red earth washed into the Nile by excessive rains in the Abyssinian Plateau. These algae allegedly deoxygenated the water, thus killing the fish, which somehow gave rise to anthrax bacteria. The frogs then sickened, left the river, the second plague, and died. Hort's third plague was mosquitoes, which had bred in the floodwaters, and her fourth was the biting fly Stomoxus calcitrans, breeding in the decaying plants left by the retreating Nile flood. The livestock disease of her fifth plague was anthrax spread by the dead frogs. The sixth plague, of boils on animals and people, was supposedly skin anthrax transmitted by the biting flies. According to Hort, the seventh plague, of hail and thunder, was a coincidental local weather feature, which also promoted the locus of the eighth plague. The ninth plague, of darkness, was allegedly caused by a desert sandstorm known as a Kamsen, which blotted out the sun by throwing into the air the blanket of fine red dust from the first plague, which was left on the ground when the widespread Nile floodwaters receded. And Hort's tenth plague was not the death of the firstborn, but the destruction of the last remains of the first fruits of the harvest, due to the corruption of the Bible text. So let's talk about her algae. The crucial element of Hort's theory is her two red algae which she claims enhanced the color of the muddy Nile water to make it red blood. However, these two algae are not normally red, in turbid flowing water that are green, so the Egyptians could not possibly have mistaken them in the Nile for a plague of blood. In over a hundred years of research, scientists have not found either species of algae in the 400 species of algae found in the Nile, nor even in the 1,000 species known to occur in East Africa. They are actually rare and fragile ice water species that belong in subarctic cold climates and are used in industrial indicators of snow and ice water temperatures. Neither causes a harmful algal bloom anywhere in the world, nor pollutes water, nor makes water undrinkable. Far from being toxic or a source of anthrax, these algae are used worldwide today as human and animal food supplements. So one of the algae is strong in antioxidant properties and is considered to be anti-carcinogenic and even promotes athletic performance. The United States Food and Drug Administration approved this algae for human consumption on the 13th of April 1995 after years of study. And the other algae is used widely as a fish food. Now for the fish, they could not possibly have died from the presence of Hort's two benign algae, nor could they have died from a lack of oxygen caused by any algae because Anoxia can only occur after an algal bloom, which cannot occur in muddy water. The fish died because they could not live in the blood. So, now let's move on to the Nile mud. The Nile mud is brown, it's not red. If Hort's blanket of mud was so thick that it formed the ninth plague of darkness when blown into the air as dust, it would have caused complete underwater darkness when it was concentrated in the waters of the Nile, thereby killing her algae outright. This is because algae are plants, so they need sunlight for photosynthesis. However, suspended mud prevents this. Likewise, suspended mud causes flocculation. That is to say, mud particles stick to any algae, which then sink. For these reasons, the silt-laden Nile at its flood time high is completely clear of all algae of every species. As Sparks says, to quote, Because Hort's theory requires both the algae and the silt that kills the algae, her theory is logically and scientifically self-destructing. If the water had been merely red-colored, the Egyptians only needed to have it stand in a vessel until the mud settled, or they could have strained it. Exodus 7, 19 and 20 says that the Nile turned to blood when Aaron struck the water with his staff. There was no time delay, no gradual accumulation of red matter, and blood appeared in streams, ponds, pools, and vessels of wood and stone. Not just in the Nile. Anthrax occurs in soil, 
It does not infect aquatic animals, for example, fish and frogs, whether dead or alive. In fact, some of the frogs returned to and remain in the Nile when God lifted the plague, Exodus 8.11. Anthrax infects mammals, for example, land animals which graze on grass contaminated by anthrax spores in the soil. Then we've got herbiting flies. They do not spread anthrax to animals or humans, nor do they feed on dead animals. In the medical veterinary history of anthrax, there are no known cases of anthrax-infected fly bites of humans, cattle, or sheep anywhere in the world. Then, Hort depends on floodwaters to breed her mosquitoes and biting flies, as well as to provide the widespread cutting of red mud dust on the land that she claims was blown aloft to cause the plague of darkness. However, Exodus makes no mention of floodwaters during the plagues. On the contrary, Moses meets Pharaoh on the banks of the Nile, Exodus 7.15, and the Egyptians dig along the Nile to search for drinking water, Exodus 7.24. These are not descriptions of a flooded river. Hort depends on flooding for her plagues of frogs, flies, and locusts, with more water added from the hailstorm. She does not explain how the Kamsen dried out this massive saturation of the alleged red mud coating so that it could have turned into dust and been blown aloft in just a few hours. The Egyptians would have been used to desert storms. Pharaoh would have hardly been influenced by one, even if it lasted for three days. It is manifestly disingenuous of Hort to claim a mistranslation of one Hebrew word in the Bible account to substantiate her naturalistic theory, and then for her to disregard the two and a half chapters of the same source document that describe in great detail the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians and the saving of the firstborn of the Israelites. We're talking about Exodus 11 verses 1 through chapter 13 verse 16. On the other hand, God acts regularly through his creation by means of natural law. Miracles are the way he acts on special occasions. In Exodus, the miraculous is seen in, number one, God foretelling of all the events to Moses so that he could announce them to Pharaoh, and two, the beginning of all the events and the cessation of them at the exact time stipulated by Moses as the agent of Yahweh and because of the actions or prayers of Moses and Aaron. And three, the localizing of the event so that Goshen, where the Israelites lived, was excluded. And fourth, the miraculous events themselves. God is not precluded from using natural phenomena or secondary agents to accomplish his special purposes. In fact, Exodus 10.13 says that God brought the locusts of the eighth plague by an east wind that blew across all the land that day and all that night. And then Exodus 10.19 says that, to end this plague, God changed the wind to a strong west wind, which caught up the locust and carried them into the Red Sea. However, this is the only plague which Moses detailed in this way. Hort and others who attempted to belittle the plagues as being no more than logical and connected sequences of natural phenomena must explain why Mother Nature has never repeated anything remotely like this sequence of events. All naturalistic explanations of the plagues lose sight of God's role as judge. Hort should also ponder why, for the last 3,500 years, the Jews in their annual Passover feast have celebrated the deliverance of their firstborn as the trigger for their exit from Egypt. Concerning the miraculous, a God who cannot work miracles is not a God worth following, nor is one who is incapable of communicating accurately what he did. Bible-believing Christians worship the one true God, who is not only the miracle-working creator, but is also lawgiver and judge. The best news of all is that he is also savior of all those who put their faith and trust in him. So, according to Exodus, God sent the ten plagues of Egypt for the following reasons. One, to deliver the Israelites. Two, to answer Pharaoh's question, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Three, so that the Israelites would know the power of Yahweh. 4. To show that the earth belongs to Yahweh, not to the Egyptian gods. And 5. To execute judgment in all the gods of Egypt. Let's list some ways in which the plagues could have spoken against the various gods of Egypt. The first plague was directed against the Nile itself, which the Egyptians worshipped as their source of life. This plague confronted the numerous river deities, including the guardian of the Nile, and the spirit of the Nile, the god of fertility, and the god of the underworld, whose blood the Nile was considered to be. By turning the Nile into blood and killing the fish, supposedly protected by the gods, 
Moses was not only shaming all these Egyptian objects of worship, but also showed their sustenance comes only from the hand of Yahweh. The second plague of an immense number of frogs attacked the Egyptian goddess, the symbol of good crops, and childbirth, usually depicted as a woman with a frog's head, as well as yet another fertility goddess. Frogs were sacred to the Egyptians. However, these goddesses were powerless to prevent these symbols of life from becoming rotten piles of death. Interestingly, the Egyptian magicians mimicked the plagues of blood and frogs with their enchantments. These could have been simulations, but more likely they were demonic miracles, as miracles are evidence of supernatural power, not just of God's power. God allowed the magicians to add to these two plagues, but not to reverse them. The third plague of lice, or gnats or mosquitoes, from the dust of the earth confronted all the gods of the earth. For example, Achor. This and the fourth plague of flies confronted another favorite, the dung beetle god. A plague of flies shows failure of the dung beetle god to do its job of burying the dung, which stops flies from breeding in the dung. This god also associated with rolling the sun across the sky, like dung beetles rolling balls of dung. The fifth plague, on the livestock, which provided food, milk, clothing, and transportation, was a direct attack on the sacred bull god, a bull god symbol of fertility, as well as, yet another one, the cow-like mother goddess, and the queen of all the gods, who wore cow's horns on her head. All these gods were shown to be imposters. The sixth plague of boils showed the impotence of any of the gods of magic and healing to protect even the magicians from the boils, and thus the power of Yahweh. The seventh plague of hail and the eighth one of locusts brought by the wind that destroyed the crops attacked the various sky deities, the gods of air, moisture, and sky, who supposedly controlled the weather. A loss of crops showed the impotence of the gods of vegetation, agriculture, and harvest. The ninth plague of darkness was an attack on the supreme deity of Egypt, the sun god, Ra, or Amon-Ra, who was believed to bring light and heat to the earth. And yet there's still more Egyptian gods that did nothing. Finally, there's the tenth plague of death of the firstborn, and it was an attack on the divinity of Pharaoh, whom the Egyptians believed was an incarnation of the sun god and the giver of life. It was the pharaoh's task to retain the favor of the gods and to uphold the laws of the goddess of order. However, he was powerless to prevent the death of his own son, the next in line divine ruler, or that of anyone else's son in the land of Egypt. Thus, Yahweh alone has absolute control of life and death. A debate rages over the credibility of the Bible's history, not only in the origins debate, but archaeology also. Most archaeologists today have concluded that there is no evidence that the exodus of Hebrew slaves from Egypt ever happened. The excellent documentary, Patterns of Evidence, Exodus, is the culmination of filmmaker Timothy Mahoney's 12-year journey around the world to search for answers. The truth is there, but most are just looking, not in the wrong place, but are attributing the wrong time period for the facts they discover. And in his other film, Patterns of Evidence, The Moses Controversy, Timothy Mahoney brings out more evidence. This thought-provoking and controversial film asks hard questions of some of the world's leading experts in Egyptology, ancient Hebrew, and early languages. And last but not least, Patterns of Evidence, The Red Sea Miracles, Part 1, Egypt. Mahoney's back again with profound new evidence you have to see to believe. This thought-provoking and controversial film takes us on an amazing journey, matching events and places in the Bible, and it asks hard questions of the world's leading experts in Egyptology, ancient Hebrew history, and languages. If you're ready to see what the facts have to say from some of the best research, and discover evidence for the authenticity of the Book of Exodus, then you can find Mahoney's documentary films at creation.com store. I am Joseph Darnell. For all of us at creation.com, thanks for listening.